Hello, everybody. <laughs> so I guess that was the end of the introduction video. So thank you all for joining us today for this edition of Nano Talks Volume 2. Today, we're really happy to welcome Samuel Phelps, who's a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard University working on isotopic fractionation in Coccolithophores. And so without further ado, I'll let Sam go ahead and share his screen and his research with you all. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks very much, Clara, for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be zooming in today to speak with you all about my research. Um, today I'll be talking about Neuralabdaceae coccolithophores as a proxy for past atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And I'll build this up through calibration, application, and explore um, what it means for neogene climate. Let's see, there we are. <clears throat> Um, so before I dive in, I just want to give a few shout outs to my funding agencies and collaborators. Um, this work is a summary of my PhD research. I'm lucky to have some wonderful collaborators in Heather Stoll, Claire Bolton, and Luke Beaufort. Um, I did my PhD at Columbia University with Pradigan Polisar. Um, and I'll show some work from culture experiments that I was fortunate to work with, work on with Gwen Hennen in Sonia Dyerman's lab at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Um, so just for context, we know from direct measurements of the atmosphere and from measurements of gas bubbles trapped in polar ice that the current atmospheric CO2 level is higher than at any time in the last 1 million years or so. And when we look at projections for the rest of the century, estimates range between about 400 and 1,000 parts per million by 2100, depending on how aggressive and successful emissions reductions and carbon capture efforts are. Uh, but what does this mean for the future? And so one of the questions motivating my research is this, just how much will temperature increase and how much will climate change given the projected change in atmospheric CO2? Better understanding the relationship between CO2 and temperature, particularly in past warm intervals in Earth history with CO2 similar to today and to those project levels projected for the future can help refine these estimates. So how far back in time do we have to go to get to modern CO2 levels? And what about for CO2 levels projected for the future? Um, people have been working on this problem for decades, and there's a rich literature of reconstructions that paint a broad picture of the evolution of CO2 um, over the Phanerozoic. And it generally, generally corresponds with our understanding of climate over the Cenozoic. Higher CO2 levels are found in the early Cenozoic, which accompanies global warmth, such as here in the Eocene, um, where there are palm trees in the Arctic. And the CO2 declined and global temperatures cooled, ice built up in the Antarctica and later in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but one time period that stands out in particular is the Miocene between about 23 and 5 million years ago, so this, this period here. Um, and we know some, from several lines of evidence that it was a time of intense global warmth with substantial ice retreat and in Antarctica, um, sea surface temperatures were about 10 degrees C warmer in the high latitudes. And there were forests in our places that are currently permafrost. Um, and much of our knowledge of this time period comes from the Alkanone CO2 proxy, um, which is one of the, um, what I will be talking about today. And so just kind of from a first principle standpoint, the algal CO2 proxy or paleobarometer is based on observations of carbon isotope fractionation in plants where CO2 comes into the cell through diffusion and is converted into organic matter by rubisco. And carbon made from photosynthesis has the potential to record environmental information because rubisco, um, this enzyme shown schematically here, um, this enzyme converts CO2 into organic matter. And so through this carboxylation reaction, it prefers carbon 12 to carbon 13 by about 11, per mil, 11 to, 20, to 30 per mil or one to 3%. And I'll use this delta notation here and this epsilon notation throughout where delta is the ratio of the 12C to 13C in a substance relative to some standard. And epsilon is basically the difference between um, delta values of two substances. So in this case, oops, apologies there. In this case, it's the difference between the organic carbon and the CO2 from which it was made. So shown here is a cartoon schematic demonstrating the underlying theoretical principle. When CO2 is plentiful up in this top panel, the kinetic preference for Rubisco is more strongly expressed and the organic matter has more of the light isotope. Um, this gives it a more negative delta 13C value because it contains more 12C. And the epsilon P value, um, a term I'll be using a lot, um, is the difference between the organic carbon and the CO2 from which it was made. Um, and that value is larger when CO2 is more abundant. 
And when CO2 is less abundant, the CO2 concentration around Rubisco will be lower and this kinetic preference can't be fully expressed, resulting in organic matter with relatively less of the light isotope, relatively more of the heavy isotope, giving it a more positive delta 13Z value and a smaller EP value. And so the classical method for interpreting alkanone um, or algal epsilon P values is based on diffusive CO2 supply, where CO2 diffuses into the cell and is converted to organic carbon. In this model, the relationship between epsilon P and CO2 can be described by a line like this um, with higher EP values at high CO2 and lower EP values at low CO2. Um, and so this 25 per mil value up here has traditionally been taken to be the maximum expression of fractionation by Rubisco at the limit of infinite CO2. So basically if, if there is no limit on the amount of um, CO2 around the cell and the cell can be as selective as it likes, it, the maximum Rubisco fractionation that you can get is about 25 per mil. Uh, but because of physiological differences between algae, different species have different relationships and may not fall in the same line. And I'll talk more about this complexity later and what causes these deviations later on. Um, but so early on efforts were made to target molecules that have a unique or monospecific source. And so what we end up using are molecular biomarkers called alkanones, which are produced by the coccolithophorid algae um, of the family Noelarabdaceae. And these organisms are special because these ma they make these long chain ketones that can um, be easily analyzed um, in sediment samples. And so we'll measure the carbon isotope ratio of these molecules, um, specifically the 37,2 methyl ketone, which is shown here on top. It has these two double bonds and a ketone head group and 37 carbons. And we use the carbon isotope ratios of foraminifera to estimate the delta 13C ratio of the inorganic carbon from which these alkanones are synthesized. And we calculate EP roughly as the difference between the two. And there's a rich body of literature studying alkanone carbon isotope fractionation through time. Here I'm showing published records of alkanone EP over the last 45 million years or so. Um, they document a general decline in EP from around 25 or 23 per mil in the Eocene to about 12 per mil in the Pleistocene. And below I'm showing the benthic foraminifera isotope stack with um, upwards on this plot indicating warmer or less glaciated conditions and down on this plot indicating colder or more glaciated conditions. And this EP record generally corresponds with climate cooling over the Cenozoic, so the higher EP in the hothouse of the Eocene. But we see an increase in EP as climate is cooling in the Miocene. And so if you were to interpret this record just in terms of CO2 as the conventional model um, suggests, then we would actually interpret this as an increase in CO2 over this time period, which does not necessarily agree with our understanding of climate through this era. Um, and when we look at the Pleistocene, where CO2 changes are known, um, the first record to try this suggested that glacial to interglacial changes in CO2 can, could be reconstructed from alkanone EP, um, which was very exciting. This is the pioneering study by Jasper and Hayes in 1990, showing a close correspondence between the ice core CO2 record and um, the CO2 levels estimated from alkanone carbon isotope ratios. But as more data were generated over the last 20 years or so, it became clear that not all locations behave the same way and that alkanone fractionation is, is likely more complicated than the classical um, or conventional method assumes. Um, and so this is perhaps unsurprising when you consider the physiologic, physiology of the cockle force that are producing these alkanones. Um, so the traditional model of understanding carbon isotope fractionation with organisms is based on land plants. You could think of this as a simple box where CO2 diffuses in, CO2 is converted to organic carbon, um, and it's just a simple passive diffusive model. But in reality, Rubisco has a slow turnover rate and a low affinity to CO2. Um, and when CO2 is not abundant enough, it can actually act as an oxygenase and oxidize organic matter and generate CO2. Um, so the concentration of CO2 in the surface ocean today is generally below the half saturation constant of the enzyme, suggesting that ambient CO2 levels are suboptimal for CO2 to behave as a carboxylase. So to overcome these limitations, the chloroplast has 
a low permeability to CO2 to keep CO2 concentrations high in the vicinity of rubisco. And algae also take advantage of the abundant DIC or bicarbonate um, in seawater. So they can actively take bicarbonate into the cell, pump it across the cell membrane into the chloroplast, convert it to CO2 through either um, enzymatic or acid-base equilibria, and then use the CO2 generated from that conversion for photosynthesis. And we see exper experimental evidence for this activity. On the right, I'm showing some culture experiments of Emiliana Huxley show an increase in the expression of genes used for anion uptake and carbonic and hydrase as DIC and CO2 decline. And on the left, I'm showing experiments that measure the uptake of CO2 and bicarbonate in E. Huxley, um, showing a shift to less CO2 uptake and more bicarbonate uptake as CO2 availability decreases. And so taking these together, it suggests that the kind of um, traditional interpretation of diffusive supply only might be too simplistic. Um, there's another interesting piece of information that um, builds on this in, and in this model, the, the maximum fractionation um, is 25 per mil, where at infinite CO2, um, Rubisco should be fully expressed. And if you measure Rubisco from a spinach leaf or from a tobacco leaf, um, in vitro, you can measure a value of 25 per mil in some early experiments. Um, projected an intercept up to 25 per mil, and so that made sense. Uh, but in recent years, uh, the Rubisco fractionation from Emiliani Huxley was measured in vitro, and um, the value returned from that was 11 per mil. So it requires um, a different explanation to achieve EP values greater than 11 per mil if the actual kinetic fractionation by the enzyme is only 11 per mil. And in addition to non-diffusive carbon uptake and these intricacies with the kinetic fractionation factor, um, some experiments have shown a direct influence of irradiance uh, or the amount of light energy on carbon isotope fractionation where both higher light intensity and longer photo periods lead to higher EP values. And so all of this is to say that the classical interpretation, interpretation of alkanone EP in terms of CO2 alone might be um, too simplistic and so what I'm going to walk you through next is a series of studies that have tried to improve our understanding of alkanone carbon isotope fractionation and bring some life back to the alkanone paleobarometer. Um, and to do this, I'm going to start in cultures where we can calibrate the proxy and probe some of the fundamental principles. Then we'll move into the ocean and look at core top samples to see how the calibration transfers out of the laboratory and into the natural environment. Then I'll aim to validate this method by comparing um, EP variations in the Pleistocene to the known influence of CO2 and cell size. And finally, I will apply this method um, to a sediment sequence from the neogene to glean new insights about um, CO2 change, climate change, and the carbon cycle over the last 20 million years or so. So first, let's look at the calibration. And the driving questions here are, um, what factors control carbon isotope fractionation in alkanone producing algae? And does the traditional diffusive model describe carbon isotope fractionation? So let's think for a second about what can modify the expression of fractionation by Rubisco and the CO2 signal in algal carbon isotope ratios. So decades of work, uh, decades of work have shown that it's not just the CO2 supply that affects EP, but the carbon demand of the cell relative to the CO2 supply. And so it's really the balance of these two processes that affects the CO2 concentration inside the cell how much of that CO2 is consumed and converted to organic matter and how strongly the fractionation by Rubisco is expressed. Um, so carbon demand is proportional to the growth rate times the carbon content of the cell. So how much carbon is it fixing? Um, larger cells and faster growing cells have a higher carbon demand. The surface area over the cell of the cell sets the area over which CO2 can diffuse into the cell. So that sets the permeability, the CO2 supply and the surface area set the diffusive CO2 supply. Um, and these cells are nearly spherical, so we can measure the cell diameter, diameter and approximate them with a spherical geometry. And in the diffusive model, the maximum EP would um, occur at 25 per mil, and we would predict that these variables would affect EP in these directions. 
Um, so what we're going to, do, going to do is look at culture experiments where these parameters are tightly controlled. Um, and what I'm showing here is a compilation of culture studies um, over the last 15 years or so, along with the, some new data from um, our study where we grew Jafur capsa oceanica in batch culture. Um, this is recently published in G cubed a few months ago. Um, and so what we find is that epsilon P does indeed decrease with increasing carbon demand relative to supply. So um, this decline here is what we'd expect kind of from first principles as the carbon demand increases relative to the CO2 supply, the carbon isotope fractionation declines. Um, but we also see that the shape of this is not linear as um, prescribed or as expected from the diffusive model. And so this black line is shown here and we see a, a big departure from diffusive model as um, carbon demand relative to supply increases. Um, and what we also see is a clustering of warm colors at the top of this plot. And the symbols here are colored by the total irradiance that the culture receives in a day. So in moles of um, photons per meter squared per day, and we see that warmer colors populate the top part of this plot. So high EP values and cooler colors populate the bottom of this plot. Um, and if we look at this in a different direction, so here it's the same data, but with daily irradiance on the x-axis and colored by the carbon demand relative to supply. So if we look at this relationship in more detail, um, what we see is that high irradiance and low demand relative to supply are required for high epsilon p values. So earlier I showed EP change um, from about 23 per mil in the Eocene to about 13 per mil in the Pleistocene. And it's possible that almost all of that could be explained um, by irradiance changes. And so that would be changing from a, about 23 per mil up here, high irradiance to about 13 per mil, a low irradiance conditions. Um, so it seems that irradiance is really driving a lot of the variability in culture experiments and that it's a parameter that we really do need to consider um, when we try to interpret sedimentary um, epsilon p data. And so what, I, what we do here is we make a simple empirical model um, of the factors influencing EP and see what it takes to explain all the variance in epsilon p in the culture experiments. Um, and this follows the approach of a study led by Heather Stoll in 2019 that was really the uh, pioneering breakthrough in this. Um, and so what we do here is, um, let's start with the left side. Um, here we're just including the parameters in the conventional diffusive model. So that's the cell size, CO2, and growth rate. And when we include those, those variables, we can explain about 50, less than 50% of the variance in epsilon p. Um, and when we include irradiance components here on the right, so that's the light hours and the light intensity, um, we, can act, we can explain almost 90% of the variance in EP in this culture data set. Um, an important thing to note here is that growth rate is actually, at least in this model, the way it's parameterized, growth rate does not appear to have a significant influence in the data. And so the p-value here is actually about 0.5. So it's not statistically significant. Um, so that means that moving forward, as we look into the environment, we will not have to quantitatively constrain growth rate using this model. Um, but so just to summarize the behavior of EP that we find in the culture experiments when we put these data together and just look at the variables that are driving the variance in EP, um, it's different from what the traditional models have suggested and that the kind of a diffusive supply framework is not sufficient to explain the variance of EP that we see in culture experiments where everything is tightly controlled. Um, and so this is really just an extension of that, the work by, led by Heather Stoll in 2019. Um, and so these predictors are slightly different from that, the model in that study, um, but we'll take this 
next out of the laboratory and into the natural environment. Um, and so the driving question here is, do these same patterns observed in culture quantitatively describe alkaline EP in the modern ocean? Um, and so the things that we need to consider are irradiance, CO2, and cell size. So fortunately, we have a way to constrain cell size. Some really fundamental work by Urentia Hendricks found intact coccospheres in sediments throughout the Cenozoic and measured the cell diameter and the cockliff length and by SEM. And um, that study in 2007 found that cockliff length and cell diameter are very highly correlated. And that's shown here in this right panel. Um, this has been confirmed in culture experiments um, there's some data by McClellan and all of 2016 that has a rich data set of culture experiments that come to the same conclusion. Um, but so what this means is by measuring cockleth length in sediment samples you, using microscopy, we can then estimate the geometry of the cell and constrain cell radius as one of the inputs into the EP model. So for this study, what we did was we produced new core top EP and cockleth size data. Um, we compiled existing core top and water column um, particulate data. And for this presentation, I'll, I'll focus on the core tops because what we're really interested in is reconstructing CO2 from sedimentary alkanone and EP. The particulate results are a little more complicated and nuanced, uh, mostly because the environmental conditions at the collection depth at which the water was pumped um, at a single point has a Lagrangian history because the alkanones are produced over the course of days, but the sampling condition only represents one depth and a, as a point sample in time. Um, but what we also did here was we compiled all cock with the four assemblage and size data that you find in the literature. Um, and we examined the influence of irradiance, size, and CO2 on alkanone EP. Um, and in the core tops, uh, the approach here is empirical, but what we do is we set the depth of production to 75% of the mixed layer depth. We calculate the irradiance at that, um, at that depth and use that as the input in the model. And when we do this, what we find is um, that we actually have a reasonable ability to model alkaline EP in core top sediments. And so the relationship here is scattered, but um, using the multilinear regression model derived from the culture experiments, we're capturing the magnitude and direction of EP change in core top sediments. Um, and so some of the scatter in the left panel is related to uncertainty in the measurements and some from the applied irradiance value. But when we look at the residuals um, shown on the right, so it's the culture calibration, the residuals of the calibration in the gold color and the residuals of the um, modeled versus measured in the sediments, um, they share, share it, the two curves share a lot of structure. And so some of the the uncertain, the, the error in this um, measured versus model plot is related to the structural uncertainty in the calibration. Um, but so what this, the, the main takeaway from this for me is that we are actually able to quantitatively take these transfer functions developed in the laboratory to the natural environment. And because we can model EP with some degree of accuracy and precision, we can then extract environmental information from it um, going down core. So I wanna take a quick detour and talk about um, one of the other findings of this study. Um, it's currently in revision at G cubed and will hopefully be out um, in the next few weeks or month. Um, but so earlier I showed how EP is proportional to cellular carbon demand relative to diffusive CO2 supply. Um, we found support for this relationship in cultures, although the relationship is not linear um, as prescribed by the diffusive model. Um, so the conventional model um, applies a linear relationship between EP and demand over supply shown here, um, where lower EP occurs at higher growth rates and because they are, these are spherical cells at um, larger cell sizes as well. So in paleo applications of this conventional method, because cell size and growth rate were difficult to constrain, all biological factors other than CO2 were lumped into this B parameter, which if you're familiar with the literature, if you've seen um, 
some of the works upon which this is built. This, this equation might be familiar to you um, where this EP equals 25 minus B over CO2. And so 25 is that the intercept of this plot, which is the maximum um, fractionation by Rubisco. So at infinite CO2, this, the limit of this is zero and um, the EP value would be 25 per mil. And the B value is essentially the slope of this plot. Um, so early calibration work um, showed that the B value that you needed if you went out to the ocean and you took a sample from the surface ocean and you measured the CO2 value, you measured the epsilon P value um, and saw, plugged them into this equation and solved it. Um, <clears throat> early work showed that the B value that you needed to solve that equation was highly correlated with the phosphate concentration um, in the seawater in those samples. So what I'm showing here in this left panel is the canonical work by Bidegary et al. in 97 that calibrated the alkanone CO2 proxy by sampling suspended particulate matter in the ocean. And at the time, this was an amazing finding because it provided a way forward to constrain B in the natural environment. If you know something about the trophic status of the um, location, um, if you know the phosphate concentration and can assume that it's relatively constant through time, you could then use this calibration estimate a B value and um, interpret EP values in terms of CO2. Um, and so this was a major breakthrough at the time. Um, and because cell size in modern alkanone producers was thought to vary little between these sites, the idea was that B mostly represents growth rate. Um, and the correlation between B and phosphate was considered a, um, a correlation between growth rate and phosphate. And so this relationship or a slightly modified version of it has really been the basis for all alkanone CO2 reconstructions over the last 20 years until just about the, the last year or two where things have really um, started to change a bit. Um, but so over that time period, much more modern data was collected. And so when I compiled all of the available data, the relationship between B and phosphate um, is actually much less robust than the original calibration work. And so shown here on the left panel is the same relationship as the previous slide. The black symbols are the same data from Bidgari et al. 97. And shown um, in the blue symbols are all, all, are all the data that have been gen generated since 1997. And it appears that the relationship between B and phosphate arises because of an underlying relationship between phosphate and CO2. And so this left panel is B regressed against phosphate. This right panel is CO2 regressed against phosphate. And the R squared values are almost identical. Um, and so what this is telling me is that the B is not actually telling you anything more um, about carbon isotope fractionation than the CO2 concentration. Um, and additionally, there have been abundant field, cam field campaigns that actually measured growth rates of alkaline producers using in situ labeling experiments. So isotope labeling experiments where you um, put uh, an incubation that, or you collect some seawater in a big cube container, spike it with um, an isotope label, put it back at depth and incubate it for a day, and then measure how much of that label was taken up. And you could calculate the growth rate from that. Um, so if we actually look at measured growth rates in the field down here in this bottom plot, regressed against B values from the same sets of samples, um, we find that there's no relationship between B and growth rate as expected from a diffusive model. And so this is uh, more evidence that the diffusive framework just might not describe how these organisms fractionate carbon either in the lab or in nature. Um, so in lieu of a like robust mechanistic understanding about carbon uptake and intracellular carbon isotope conversion, um, because we, we are still working on unraveling that mystery, um, we can instead use a, um, an empirical model like the culture-based multilinear regression. Um, and so we I just showed previously how it's um, the cortops samples suggest that when a radiance is treated consistently um, at, across sites, we can model EP with reasonable variability or with, sorry, with reasonable accuracy, but that's a radiance at various locations today. And what we really want to do is model at one point through time. 
So because we don't yet have a robust proxy for past the radiance changes, we'll have to assume that it is constant through time or allow it to follow some envelope of uncertainty. So our ultimate goal is to invert the model and solve for CO2 from alkaline and EP. And to do that, we need to identify places where radiance variations are small enough um, that EP and size are telling you about CO2. And so that takes us to the next section. Um, so where can alkaline and EP be modeled through time using known CO2 changes and constant irradiance? Um, and if irradiance is not stable in the Pleistocene, we really have no faith in it being stable in deeper time. And so if we can show that um, irradiance is relatively stable over the last 800,000 years in some sediment samples that provides us confidence for going deeper in time. And so to do this, um, we generated two new records of alkaline NEP and calculate size, compiled and standardized existing alkaline NEP records so they could be interpreted together. And we compare model to measured EP in all sites where size is known. And so here I'm plotting out uh, locations where alkaline NEP and calculate size are measured. Um, and at each location, EP is modeled using known variations in CO2 from the ice core record, along with measured cockroach size to estimate cell size changes. Because we don't have a bona fide proxy for irradiance, we have to assume that it is constant and we treat it as constant in all records. So a slope of one on this plot suggests that the measured EP is resp responding properly to CO2 and cell size changes and the radiance variations are small. Um, and an intercept, um, so, sorry, this is the one-to-one -one line in, the, in this faint dashed blue line. Um, on the y-axis is the model EP, on the x-axis is the measured EP. And so um, a slope of one is what we're looking for, for um, good performance. Um, so we see that there are two locations that really stand out, um, ODP 807 from this study and ODP 668. Um, so, um, and 925 also goes in the right direction, um, from this Zhang et al. 2019 study. Um, there's been some recent work by Alba gonzalez Lanchas et al. that just came out over the last couple of months that um, also found a good performance at site 925. And I'd encourage you to check that study out. Um, but what we see is that there, these, these two sites seem to pass the first test of um, good performance in the Pleistocene with constant irradiance. Um, so this analysis serves as an exercise to help identify which locations are promising for deeper time work. Of course, irradiance does not have to be stable on multi-million year timescales, but we view it as a prerequisite for attempting to change, attempting to reconstruct CO2 change. And let's see, yes, this is the study I just mentioned by Alba gonzalez and um, who worked at ODP 925 over MIS 12 to nine um, and found that the culture-based model, a uh, slightly different version um, can also model EP change as well from the ice core CO2 variations. And so it's, we're, we're finding agreement with this updated approach. Um, and so what is it about these, about locations that appear to behave well? Um, as, it, the irradiance at depth is a function of the irradiance at the surface, the attenuation coefficient, and the depth of production. And so we, when we look at the modern monthly variability in each of these parameters, the irradiance at the surface, the attenuation coefficient, and the mixed layer depth, um, what I'm plotting here is the monthly standard, or the standard deviation of the monthly average values of each of these parameters at these locations on the x-axis and the slope of the modeled EP versus the measured EP at each of these sites. Um, and so perhaps unsurprisingly, sites with oceanographic conditions of low variability, so um, kind of low latitude, deep mixed layer, minimal dynamics perform best. So that's where a slope is close to one. Those locations all have a low variability in the attenuation coefficient, the surface irradiance, and the mixed layer depth. And so to go deeper in time, we'll target sites that have low variability in these parameters, and that's where we'll head next on this journey. Um, so let's step in deeper into the neogene and use this um, updated alkanone paleobarometer to ask how atm atmospheric CO2 has changed over the last 20 million years and see what this means for our understanding of climate, biosphere, and carbon cycle changes. So the late Miocene um, brought about the 
expansion of C4 grasslands, um, plants that have a competitive advantage in low CO2. Uh, but there's still, and or we also saw dramatic global cooling enhanced at high latitudes, um, a reduction in marine carbonate burial. Um, but there's still some uncertainty surrounding the direction and magnitude of atmospheric CO2 change during this time period. So what we did is we generated data from a site in the Western Equatorial Pacific that was identified in the previous section as a site with good performance in the Pleistocene where we could model EP reasonably well with um, ice core CO2 variation and um, measured cell size changes. And so in this framework, EP is a function of CO2, cell size and irradiance. Um, so to get the irradiance value to use down core, we calibrate the Pleistocene samples by solving for irradiance with the known CO2, the measured cell radius and the measured EP value and apply a constant irradiance value down core. Um, and when we do this, we see that um, CO2 declined by about 600 um, ppm over from the early Miocene to the Pleistocene. So these are the data shown here. Um, the Epsilon P record has a slight M-like structure with a maxima in the middle Miocene. Um, we found that cockleth length and inferred cell radii were up to about two times higher in the early Miocene compared to the Pleistocene. Um, and all else equal, given this empirical function, um, larger cells require higher CO2 values to produce the same EP value. So what we see is about a 600 ppm decline in CO2 from the early Miocene to the Pleistocene. Um, and these results find support from independent work at ODP site 1088 by uh, Thomas Tanner um, and Heather Stoll's group. Um, and so we're starting to, conver to converge on this idea that Miocene CO2 is actually perhaps a bit, quite a bit higher than um, previously estimated. Um, so let's look at what this CO2 history means for global climate and environmental change. Um, the bottom panel shows our new CO2 estimates on top of the benthic delta H and stack. Um, and I took the averages of the middle Miocene, middle to early Miocene, uh, late Miocene, and Plyo Pleistocene. Um, and the top panel is showing temperature anomalies from Herbert et al. 2016 broken into different latitude bands. Um, turning SST into global average temperature is difficult, but these red boxes show estimates for the late. Miocene in the middle early Miocene from global paleoecological data. And of course, the, of course these reconstructions have their uncertainties, um, but the late Miocene was likely four to five degrees C warmer than pre-industrial. The middle Miocene was maybe seven to eight degrees C warmer than pre-industrial. And before any quantitative analysis, we can see that um, these higher temperatures are associated with higher CO2. Um, what I'm showing in the middle panel is the timing of the initiation and expansion of C4 grasslands around the globe. So this open circle is the first evidence of C4 in the landscape and the closed circle is when they dominated the landscape in each of these regions. And we see that the global expansion really seems to occur after about 9 million years when there's a big stepwise decrease in CO2. When we look at the data quantitatively in terms of earth system sensitivity, um, which is the equilibrium temperature response to a doubling of CO2, we see that values fall between about four and six degrees C for a doubling of uh, CO2, which is in agreement with estimates from the Pliocene and the Eocene. Um, so this is an exciting result, I think, that shows that CO2 decline in the Miocene accompanied global cooling and grassland expansion. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit into the final section of this and just show you one um, final finding from this work. And so the two main proxies we have for the carbonate system are the algal CO2 proxy and the boron isotope pH proxy. Um, these figures I'm showing here from the research coordination network. Um, it's this NSF sponsored project to kind of vet CO2 estimates and compile them in a publicly available database. Um, and so the, the website for that is this paleoco2.org website. I encourage you to check it out. There's a lot of great resources there and all of the CO2 data that is available basically can be is, has been compiled there. Um, and vetted. But if we think back to basic marine chemistry courses, there are kind of six components of the marine dissolved inorganic carbon system. CO2, bicarbonate, carbonate ion, DIC, alkalinity, and pH. 
And with two of these six parameters, you can calculate the rest. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to take these new CO2 estimates, um, pair them with existing estimates of pH from the Bohr isotope proxy and um, solve the carbonate system. I think in the, um, let's see, actually just for a little background, um, Bohr isotope ratios in marine carbonates are really a pH proxy. Like the carbonate system, the speciation of borate ion and boric acid is pH dependent. As pH increases, more of the total boron exists as borate ion. So these two chemical species have an offset of about 27 per mil. Um, and because of isotope mass balance, the delta 11 B value of borate ion increases, pH increases. Um, and marine carbonates record the delta 11 B of borate and the signal of that pH. So that's how we can measure boron isotope ratios and get back to a pH value. Um, here's a beautiful flow chart from the Paleo CO2 website that I described that explores all the parameters that go into these calculations. Um, this is more detailed than is necessary right now, but the key thing that I want to point out is that I will I'm basically just focusing on these last two steps. So second carbonate system motion, second carbonate system parameter is going to be the CO2 aqueous record that we generated in previous slides and the existing pH records. So if we look at existing pH data for this time period, um, this is the record from Sozian et al. 2018 with the axis inverted. So more acidic is positive here, more basic is um, down on this plot. Um, there's very little change in pH through the late Miocene and into the Pleistocene. It's slightly more acidic in the um, Miocene. And so in this study, um, these authors converted pH estimates to CO2 estimates um, by estimating surface DIC concentrations from benthic delta 11 B pH records, assuming a deep ocean carbonate ion concentration based on the depth of the lysocline, or sorry, the depth of the um, carbonate concentration depth and a secular change in calcium ion and an assumed constant um, DIC change from surface to deep. And so instead of that, we could take the CO2 record and pair it with this pH record and then calculate the DIC that we get from this. And so that is shown here um, in the bottom panel in purple. And so what we find is that DIC, given this higher CO2 and um, relatively basic pH, the DIC needed to be quite a bit higher in the Miocene up to about 50% to 100% higher than in the Pleistocene. And alkalinity, given the, the relationships of the carbonate system, um, was also likely higher in the Miocene compared to today. So this is a, definitely a different finding from many of the, the inferences either modeled or inferred from secular variations in calcium concentration and in um, and using the calcium carbon um, calcium carbonate compensation depth as a proxy for carbonate burial. Uh, but when we look at the sedentary record, um, do we see any support for this um, finding in the literature? Um, there's some early work by um, Baptiste Citrus Marx and Jurincha Dur Hendricks in 2014 um, that was built upon by some work by C. and Rosenthal in 2019 suggests that carbonate burial in the Miocene was much higher than it is in the Pliocene and Pleistocene. So in this study, about two to four times higher than in the Pleistocene. Um, and these authors here argued that higher burial fluxes were maintained by higher weathering fluxes and greater alkalinity supply to the ocean during the, um, during the Miocene. And so what could support these higher alkalinity fluxes? Um, and perhaps the answer lies in volcanic outgassing um, which is an external lever on the slow carbon cycle. So global compilation of rift length shown in panels A and B here, um, shows more extensive geological rifting in the Neogene compared to the Pleistocene, um, suggesting that CO2 outgassing was higher, driving higher CO2 levels, global warmth and enhanced weathering in the Miocene. Um, so this is all still a bit of a work in progress. Um, we're working on expanding these findings to other sites and kind of digging into this more quantitatively. But I think the the existing data suggests 
if taking both the pH data and the CO2 data at face value, which we have no reason not to, um, the solution is a very different picture of the carbonate system than has been previously put forward. Um, so just to conclude, what I've shown is that Alkanone EP records up CO2 variations, but not through um, the diffusive model. And irradiance, as others have, have demonstrated before, um, is a key independent influence on EP. Um, EP can be modeled in core top sediments, suggesting the same factors that are at play in, ocean, uh, in, in the ocean. Um, for paleo reconstructions, minimizing variability in irradiance is essential, and actually developing a proxy for irradiance will be um, a major contribution in my view. Um, and we find a large CO2 decline in the neogene consistent with the expansion of C4 grasslands and global cooling. And pairing this with foreign isotope pH records suggests that alkalinity and DIC were uh, much higher in the Miocene compared to today. Um, so thank you very much. With that, I will, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so if anybody who has a question who's in the room can raise their hand, then go feel free, go ahead. <laughs> so thanks, Sam, for a great talk. Super My pleasure, thanks. Okay, while we're waiting for people to wake up, I have a question. Um, <laughs> my question's about irradiance and mm -hmm. how you could potentially look at changes in irradiance in the past. I mean, obviously it's good to choose sites where you think that there's been little change in irradiance, mm -hmm. but how realistic do you think that really is? And is there some way by looking at past insulation or orbital parameters, we could try and model changes in mixed layer depth that might be propor proportional to changes in par at, at production depth? Mm -hmm. Definitely, yes. Um, that is the question that keeps me up at night. Um, I think the kind of the, the insulation variability is relatively small on like that we can account for maybe plus or minus 10% or something. It's really changes in the production depth, as you mentioned, are, are in the mixed layer depth, they're really the kicker because given the exponential attenuation in irradiance, um, let me just go to that quickly. Um, the, if you, in many locations, if you change irradiance by, oh, let's show this one. Um, I just want to share this again. So here's a, a hypothetical irradiance at depth curve given two different attenuation coefficients and different um, surface irradiance values, um, you could have a relatively small change in the production depth, let's say from 50 to 25 meters that could actually change irradiance by a factor of two. And so that is, so really trying to constrain the, the depth of production is, is the major question. I think there are some promising, both micropaleontological and um, geochemical proxies that might get after this. And so there's some work by Ivan Hernandez Almeida that um, looked at the difference between like deeper dwelling and surface dwelling for aminifera in the oxygen isotope difference between the two can tell you about the structure of the mixed layer. I mean, Clara, you have work looking at this as well for a different, um, to a different end, but same means um, to kind of generally characterize the trophic status and the structure of the upper water column, I think really throwing all qualitative and quantitative indicators we have at it is going to be necessary. Um, so that's kind of like cocklyph floristics also to look at whether there are um, indicators of more eutrophic or um, oligotrophic status. The, yeah, I guess the, the difficult yeah. bit then becomes 
quant making it quantitative. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, there's some culture work that suggests the hydrogen isotope ratios and the coccolith carbon isotope ratios um, tell you something quantitative about irradiance, but those calibrations are definitely um, in their infancy. So it's an, okay. an active area of research for yeah. our group and others, I think. Thanks. Um, yeah. There's a couple of hands that have gone up in the room. So Mario, would you like to go first? Hi, hi all. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, well, there's a lot of to digest in your model, so <laughs> I'm not able to understand it all. But um, if I understood correctly, your data suggests, your last data the, the suggests that uh, there might be uh, some changes on the quantification of CO2, of PCO2, during the Miocene related to the previous uh, uh, interpretation. So how does it change? Do you have a, a, a graph that shows you where your values are positioned in terms of uh, the, 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 the forecast, the present day values of PCO2 and the, 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 the forecast for the next, uh, mm. for the next years? Do you have, mm -hmm. a, 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 let's say an update of the first rec or the first graph that you show this? Yes, I, I unfortunately do not. That is a, a good way to characterize it, but the maximum estimates that we're getting in the middle Miocene are around 800 parts per million. Um, and so that, if we go back to that first figure, we're, I mean, we're somewhere up here between six and 800. So okay. in line with the business as usual or slightly reduced business as usual. Um, and yes, there's some, the, there's a, I mean, Clara's 2016 paper, um, Bolton and all 2016 in nature communications. Um, and the Stoll 2019 quaternary science review and uh, Tanner at all 2020 in um, paleo paleo are all records that have kind of, um, or all studies that have put forward an updated or updated CO2 record for this time period. Um, and so there's some literature out there that if you're curious, I would point you to. Okay, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thanks, Melia. Uh, Ines, would you like to ask Sam your question? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Samuel. And um, I would like to ask you, uh, did you find out in your sample some diatoms? I, I was not looking for diatoms in these samples. Um, most of the, so at least in the, the um, like Pleistocene neogene sequences that I am working on, um, they're 90% carbonate particular, or in, for the most part. So Biogenic silica is not a major component of the lithology there. Okay, because I'm asking uh, datums are excellent proxy for Palo environment that you mm. try to study with boron, but datums are much better to use for alkalinity and other things, uh, nutrients, proxy, and those things that you also incorporated in your study. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, much better for those results are diatoms. Okay. That is, thank you. Because um, they are very sensitive environmental mm -hmm. parameter and they will tell you uh, some datums are good for, um, for organic matter. They said it's very high organic matter. You have very high alkalinity, low alkalinity environment, uh, eutrophic, oligotrophic. They are very good really mm -hmm. for environmental proxies. As environmental proxies, sorry. No, that, thank you. That's that is wonderful to know. I I have not looked at the the um, silicious component of these at all, really, or in detail. Um, but I will definitely keep that in mind. And finding sites that might have a larger breadth of um, potential proxies that we could exploit would be very helpful. So if there are diatoms that are that are good indicators of alkalinity change that I would be very, very interested in that. Mm 
Oh, yes, they are good and they can say about something or uh, about circulation, uh, upwelling system and those things as well, not just uh, sure. oligotrophic alkalinity, temperature, mm -hmm. <laughs> salinity, <laughs> for those things, they're very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Edith. Uh, I see Patricia has her hand up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thanks a lot for the presentation. It was actually really nice. And I have many questions, of course, because it was quite complex in some parts. But first of all, I was a bit surprised about some of the results that you show. And mm -hmm. first, like when you compare the culture calibration with the sediments, mm -hmm. I was surprised in a way to see this very well a correlation with the probability model that you showed because mm -hmm. of course the culture is very limited. And you were mentioning first about the size that you don't expect to be like a very large distribution in size and the normal sediments, but I, I mean, I don't, I mean, depends what you mean for that. So that sure. was my so, <laughs> Yes, um, I might've been a little confusing and, and conflated things there. So we, um, when, when I was mentioning that we, the, the limited size variability, that was the, um, assumption that went into the kind of the conventional Bidigari calibration. So they, the, uh, the assumption in that work was that size didn't vary much in the modern environment so that you could basically treat it as consistent throughout that calibration. But in our samples, we, we did measure size and it ranges from between about like two microns to three and a half microns or something like that. So we, we do have constraints on size and it is quite variable in the, in the modern ocean. So the the application of the culture-based model to the sediment samples includes measurements of size. So we, we, we measure the size as well as the, we estimate the CO2 from kind of the GLODAP database with an a, accounting for um, the anthropogenic influence also. And so we use those and then a the irradiance at three quarters of the mixed layer depth in each location to calculate EP. So there is, there is substantial size variation there, but when we include that quantitatively in the model, we still are able to kind of get much of the same structure. I know I understand. Okay. Yeah, the second Thank question you. was about the irradiance. Mm. And, um, and I saw the side that you uh, work on is an equatorial side. So mm -hmm. the deep chlorophyll maximum is, so the production layer, so the signal that eventually you have in the sediment, you is about hundred meters so or more. So mo most of the production is quite deep in, in this side. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering like, um, so when you are reconstructing the CO2 based on, on this uh, on this site, that is mm -hmm. a very I mean, mm -hmm. deep production layer, what are the implications in terms of like CO2 reconstructions that are not at the interface with the atmosphere? Which might yeah. Person? Yeah. So the, that's a great question. The, I mean, the mixed layer at this location is quite deep. It's about a hundred meters, I believe. But so, so it should still have some, um, it, it's, it's not, you're right. It's not at the interface, but it should still have um, good communication with, the atmosphere. And so it's not a place where there's really substantial outgassing or there is some, some vertical upwelling today. Um, it was likely a little bit below the equator around 10 million years ago. Um, but yes, it's, that's something that we are struggling with also. Um, I don't think it's, it's not that the production today is not deep enough. I don't think that it's that you're really getting a, a respiration signal of CO2. Um, and it, given its kind of relatively stable oceanography over the last 20 million years, and it hasn't moved that much, it didn't go like from a gyre to a upwelling site, that I think the majority of the signal that we would be seeing is something that is, is static and consistent. And so even if it is a bit of a, a elevated CO2 signal relative to the, to the surface and the atmosphere, it's, I would argue that it's likely just offset in that direction. And we actually calibrate it to the Pleistocene. So we're accounting for that already when we go down core because the irradiance value is just that we apply is just whatever irradiance we need to get the Pleistocene to work basically. Um, 
So it is, it, if the, the actual CO2 value is a little bit higher, I think we are correcting for that. Um, I would be, um, or I, I'm eager to apply this to other locations through this time period. And there's some data that I can do that with that I just haven't been able to pull together for this yet. But um, I think once we can combine several sites and look at the, the general trend, some of, the, some of those uncertainties should be, we should be able to eliminate. I hope, but we'll see. But thank you for the questions, I appreciate it. For those of you that are still there, I had a couple of announcements I wanted to make. The first was that if you're planning on coming to INA 18 in Avignon next year, there's a, a, a little expression of interest form that we'd love you to fill in to help with our planning. I'm going to put the link to that in the chat. And secondly, our next NanoTalks 2 speaker is going to be Blanca Alcin from the University of Salamanca, exactly one month from now on November the 18th. So I'll just give you that link and thank you very much for joining us. It was great to have such a big turnout at Nano Talks. And thanks, Sam, again, for uh, such an interesting talk. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you all for listening and for your questions. I appreciate it. Okay, that's the, the link in there for the INA teen expression of interest for those of you that might not have seen it on the Facebook page, et cetera. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of day. <laughs>